Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy, the show that talks 100% LA Galaxy soccer. We're glad you joined us. Now it's time to sit back and relax. Your hosts navigate through the twisting, turning, but never boring world, the five-time MLS Cup champion, LA Galaxy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Guessman, coming to you on a wonderful Thursday, June 18th. Uh, let's see, July 8th is when the tournament is supposed to start, and uh, that means we're not that far away. Uh, we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about. Uh, I know on Monday we talked about how there would be no guarantee there even would be a tournament, and the trend of COVID cases continues to sort of, uh, I don't know, mystify. It's certainly not mystifying, but increase in Orlando. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're also going to talk about the TV and scheduling issues that are currently going on with MLS, ESPN, Fox, uh, Univision, how that's going to go. Uh, Bruce Arena makes a, a special sort of uh, appearance. He's not actually on the show, but we're going to quote him, and so then he will make a special appearance in that way. Uh, transfer window information, let's see. And, of course, uh, L.A. talks uh, about an NWSL expansion team. I d I'll be honest, I didn't expect to have this discussion with you all, so uh, it'll be an interesting sort of uh, fun show. You have to do it. Help me out. The hammer's back. It's Eric, the Portuguese hammer. Here. How's it going, buddy? It's going all right. It's nice to be back. I know uh, last week we couldn't do uh, a live show per se. Still recorded one, knocked one out. Uh, but happy to, to do it live again. There's something about the excitement of a live show that, that gets gets the juices flowing. Yeah, and I, I was going to say for the for the YouTube followers, uh, or maybe I should say for the podcasters who can't see your your lovely choice of apparel today, is that that's a that's a Luca Nose Heart shirt, is it not? Yeah, yeah, it's the new Luca Nose Heart logo. Had to go and support that he has supporters tees. Uh, and Galaxy colors, Houston Dynamo colors, and Inter Miami colors. So uh, it actually was sold out the first run. So I was able to, when they went back up, they restocked. I, I loaded up. So anything to support AJ Lucano's heart and that cause, uh, I feel a very close connection uh, to him and what from his time with the team. So anything I can do to support, if you haven't already gone so and picked up some merchandise, I su suggest you look up uh, Lucano's heart and get some merch. And it's a good uh, quality yeah. shirt. It, it seems like it's nice. It seems like this. By the way, AJ uh, just announced him and Megan uh, are expecting child. Uh, let's see. Daughter number three. I should say daughter number three. Uh, AJ single handedly trying to put together an NWSL team. I think he could. Be, I think he's the secret investor for L.A. I think that's what it is. It's uh, it's AJ De La Garza. But uh, congratulations to AJ and Megan. Uh, two wonderful daughters already. Um, and so they're going to add a third. Like I said, AJ is out there uh, just 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 laying out the girls like crazy. Is that one of those things, Hammer? You think he was like, I'm going to try. I'm going to try one more time. Like this was one of those. It's like, you know. It's, it's one of those things. I know a few families that have had kind of similar situations where it's either all girls or all boys. And you you throw that last one and say, OK, maybe we'll get something different. And you end up uh, with the, with the same same gender there. But part of me likes it. I dig it when you have you have the whole army of boys or the whole, you know, gang of girls, you know, hashtag girl dad. So I, I, I'm good with it either way. I, I'm, you know, my situation. I got I got I got a pair. I got the collection, one say. of each. And I'm good. Um, but but, you know, if I, I, you know, w when that all shook out, I was like, oh, it'd be, be nice if my daughter, you know, had a younger sister. They can, you know, be buddies and kind of pair up. But at the end of the day, it's all good. You know, yeah, big yeah, families yeah, can't whatever. be mad at that. Yeah, the guy, the guy who has one of each is talking right now. That's that's the, like, <laughs> oh, you know what? It's fine. Whichever way it, it works. Collect the whole set. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, actually, I, you know, yeah. I have, I was going to say I have a son from a, from a previous marriage, so I was convinced that that my my son who was born uh, or, uh, or uh, late last year was going to be a girl. I was like, oh, it's going to be a girl. I'm going to have one of each. I'm going to be able to be like, listen, I have a boy, I have a girl. I'm done. That's it. Yeah, and that's a, that's not happening. So uh, anyway, I think I should just collect wiener dogs like you. I think that's what that, I'm. That's I'm gonna my start move. Doing. I was going to say that's... when my wife starts talking about kid number three, I was like, how about another dog? So uh, we're up to two dogs. So we'll we'll see we'll see how those numbers increase. The good news is those wiener dogs don't take up that much space. You can you can get a bunch of them. I mean, you could have five they, or six, and and I think you'd be just fine. So you 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 can, say, they're quite you can long, but there. they're quite long, but they're low to the ground, so they're easy to store. That's what she said. All right, so oh, uh, TV and Phenomenal. scheduling <laughs> issues for Major League Soccer. Let's start there. This has been and and listen, I'll, I'll be honest. We all expected to have a schedule already for this tournament. Um, I think everybody was pretty surprised that we're not going to have one. And by the way, uh, Jonathan Tannenwald, who's always tuned into all the scheduling TV mysteries around Major League Soccer and NWSL and soccer in general, uh, tweeted out that the, he did not expect a schedule this week and it was going to come next week. Now, uh, basically being told that it's not happening this week and. 
I think we can tie the two things together. Um, Sam Steschko did a great job covering this in The Athletic. And uh, listen, they don't pay me to say this, so please understand this whenever I say it. If you don't have an Athletic subscription, um, in my opinion, and I don't think it's a very difficult opinion, uh, they're the best at covering Major League Soccer. If you're an MLS person, it, from, it's worth the money. There are articles about Major League Soccer all the time. They're always insightful, and they're always giving you some great looks at things that you, you probably wouldn't see anywhere else. So I would go subscribe to The Athletic. Um, for that reason, uh, and I do, and you do, um, and yes. so we get all these we, we get we get all these articles. And and, and I'm going to play devil's advocate. The argument is it's behind the paywall. You know, when the, a ton of free content in there. Why do I need to get it? And and you just said it. It's it's they're the best at providing the coverage. And you can get your recaps and soccer news elsewhere. To me, it's their their deep dives into kind of the the oddball type stories. They get a lot of details and things that. You, you won't find on your regular ESPN or, or your your other other types of coverage. They do that deep dive. They find the fan who was in the fourth row when the ball got kicked into the stands and he was interviewed. You know, that that type of you'll get that type of in-depth thing. So you get what you pay for. So, uh, you know, and there's a lot of people out there who are probably borrowing Netflix accounts. So if, yeah. you, if that's your model and you want to, you know, team a Fine. subscription, I, I'm, yeah. I can't condone that. But that's something people do. That is, I've heard, I've heard that. Um, or, you know, you could probably just listen to us and then we'll tell you most of what's going on. Too. <laughs> that's, all, um, that's true. This, this but I want to give, I, not officially yeah, I, I, sponsored I, by the athletic. Yeah, exactly. That's what, exactly. That's why it's not. Um, uh, so Sam Cheshko wrote this article talking about the TV and scheduling issues. So we're going to talk about what is going on behind the scenes and why there's some tension and why that tension is going to one, delay the schedule probably that is coming out. Uh, and two, could possibly mean bad things for MLS down the road, although I don't know how bad things are. I mean, really, what I see in this article more than anything is just the confirmation that I have said that Fox's broadcasts are low budget. Like, uh, I'm going to say they're bad. Um, I It's not against the announcers. It's never been. But the production value of their shows is nothing compared to ESPN. And we have numbers to sort of prove that uh, once again. So, um Here's what's going on. All these games are taking place. And again, uh, 54 games, 54 games. Yeah, 54 games, um, 54 games taking place at the ESPN wide world of sports complex in Orlando. Um, ESPN is producing all of them. Obviously, it's their campus. You know, it's Disney. It's ESPN. It's their campus. They're doing it. And whenever all of this started, Eric, they had started by talking directly with uh, ESPN. So MLS was thinking about doing this tournament. They're going to have it at the Worldwide Sports Complex, and they're going to talk to the person who is uh, going to be producing those, which is going to be ESPN. It makes sense. I mean, if you're even going to make the first phone call you make isn't going to be to Fox, who isn't going to be producing this. The first phone call you're going to make is to ESPN. But Fox is a little upset that that they reached out to ESPN first, and that's sort of where all of this uh, starts. So let's get over some 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 of the numbers here, um, just from all the stuff. Um, again, ESPN will produce every single match, but they're going to basically share the feeds with Fox and with with Univision for them to be to produce. But it's ESPN's directors, their producers, their TV cameras, their employees, their technology, uh, including if they want to put in the goalpost cams, which we know is an ESPN staple. Uh, we know that there's probably going to be some virtual digital signage, uh, and we also know that. The, might be some virtual fans somehow, some way that they're also planning on putting into this. So they're doing a lot. Um, Steshko reports basically that ESPN spends about $100,000 on a normal MLS broadcast. Let's contrast per that. Game. Yeah, per game. Um, let's contrast that to Fox, who spends $75,000. And there's $25,000 difference there that is felt Really, 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 probably just m mostly for me is felt in the webcam type graphics that you get from behind the goal from Fox. I swear they put like, you know, uh, a, a little HD webcam behind the goal. And they're like, here you go. It'll be perfect. And then it looks it looks horrible. And meanwhile, ESPN has like 4K or 8K TVs hidden inside the goalposts. Um, so it's just it's all these. Do you feel the same way about the production value yeah. that you can tell? Yeah, you, you can absolutely tell. I mean, you mentioned it. it has nothing to do with the, the broadcasters or the people who are calling the game themselves, but the camera angles, the production quality, the lead up into it, ESPN, they're the worldwide leader for a reason. And it's just they're, they're, they're pros at what they do. So it doesn't surprise me that it costs more for them to produce per game because, like you said, the, you know, in the goal cams and everything that goes along with it, it's going to cost them 125, 125,000 per game uh, with the Orlando tournament. Cause there are going to, uh, you know, MLS talked about the pr presenting new angles and having 
added production value to this. So it doesn't surprise me that it costs a little bit more. We talked about it with the athletic, you get what you pay for. So the, you know, when you want a higher quality broadcast, it's, it's going to end up costing more money. Um, the only other thing you mentioned who you're going to talk to first. And the fact that ESPN is partially owned by Disney, which is where their properties are going to be staying. That's where the conversation started. And so uh, I know the article on the athletic talks about how Fox wasn't happy that they weren't involved in the early discussions, but it was kind of, it surprised no one. Uh, the ESPN was the first call. The part that was actually surprising is that Fox and Univision were going to carry games. And that's because ESPN has previous uh, contractual agreements on programming and what they could share. So they need other avenues because you don't want this to be an online platform that defeats the whole purpose. If you want to make the games available every day and then you say well, only it's only going to be online, then that limits the amount of people who can watch it. So I, I kind of see where Fox Sports is coming from. But at the same time, they shouldn't be surprised or, or take it personally. Well, well, here's the thing. We talked about the hundred thousand k, you know, hundred thousand dollars per game. Basically, is the normal. ESPN says they're going to spend about one hundred twenty five thousand on each game for the tournament. If you multiply that by all the games, Eric, that's six point seven five million dollars for the tournament, um, which is a ton. But it also includes housing and feeding the crew that is going to be there as well. So um, they're basically in lockdown. So you have that and the, all the new technologies, like you said, the new angles, all that stuff is is certainly going to take into account as well. So. Um, that's where it is. Taylor Twelman and John Champion look like they're going to be broadcasting for ESPN, but even that they, it seems, are not going to be on site um, to do this. It seems like they're going to broadcast remotely, um, which I kind of understand how this is, th th why that would be and how it goes. But um, most of the games are going to be broadcast on ESPN and ESPN2, which is great because those are both great. By the way, uh, there is a hit that gets ha that happens, which is hysterical to me because I don't know about you. When you think about ESPN and ESPN2, they're basically the same channel in my mind. They're just there's they're just like they have different things on like there's there's no difference. Right. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. OK, I mean, so. In, in the yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're going well, somewhere I, with this. I'll back off. Yes, I am. I, I am. Go on. <laughs> so, the, the the interesting thing, and whenever I've talked to some of the ESPN guys, is that there is a viewership hit. If you start on ESPN two, or if you have a game on ESPN two, you get less viewers than if you're on ESPN. Uh, it has a function, obviously, to do with how many people carry ESPN versus how many people carry ESPN two. And it's not necessarily like for like, although on every TV package I've ever had, it's ESPN and ESPN two. Um, so yeah, well, I but off is ESPN yeah. news and classic. That's where it's you start to really lose viewers there. Yeah, you do. And so um, so when you look at 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 what they're doing, so, you know, you're going to get most of these over the not over the air, but in, on cable on ESPN and ESPN two. if they needed to, they could go ESPN plus, which we know MLS live has been on ESPN plus, which does a good job. And there's tons of soccer games available on ESPN plus whenever things are in a normal sort of cycle right now, uh, which they're not. Um, so you can, you can find all that stuff they can, but really the idea is to get as many eyes on this as possible. And so that's why Garber wants Fox involved. Well, not only are they a TV partner and remember ESPN and Fox teamed up, um, on the TV deal for major league soccer along with Univision. So they, that was a package deal they put together to basically provide to major league soccer and said, Hey, we're going to pay you, you know, $90 million. I, I think is what it was uh, per year uh, for this many years, that type of thing um, to go and, and do these things. So they want all three of them with Fox now mad. Uh, there's even some worries that this could carry over into the next TV negotiations that are they're coming up. And basically they're going to start, I think um, discussing those in 2021. So really we're, you're, you're already halfway to 2021 yeah. as we go. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that could happen here. Um, so there has to be this sub license to Fox and basically ESPN is saying, well, it's costing me $125,000. So pay me $125,000 from what I can tell. And from the story reports, they're not even marking it up. They're not even like, Hey, we're going to make money off this. They're just like, no, no, no. This is how much it's going to cost it's us. The and so this. Yeah. Yeah. And the and, article and, and, also and, mentions that Fox is not willing to go up. And the unfortunate part in all this is MLS is stuck in the middle, uh, because ESPN's producing it and it's their, it's their feed. If Fox and, and Univision don't want to play ball, essentially ESPN could say, well, then we're just going to throw the rest of the games on ESPN plus and, and we're done. But MLS, like you said, they want eyeballs on it. So they have to broker a deal in the middle and kind of play the middleman. And, uh, you know, maybe ESPN isn't going to get the full 125, but maybe MLS can get them to move up from 75. That I feel like that's where it's going to end up landing is Fox and Univision saying when we bro broadcast it, that's not how we do it. So, 
uh, we're not paying because that's not what we do. But at the same time, if they're getting a benefit, okay, we'll up our normal price a little bit. So uh, I'm sure it's negotiations. They'll, they'll meet in the middle uh, and we'll see where it lands. Yeah, because, I mean, right now you're looking at a 50K difference, right? I mean, that's a that's not a little small amount of money. Um, per game. And Yeah, per game. Yeah, 50K per game uh, that Fox does. And, and like we said, the majority of these are going to be on ESPN. So this is only probably, I'm going to guess, out of 54 games, I'm guessing that like 13 of them or 14 of them are alternately broadcast, not on ESPN. So either Fox sports yeah. or, or, or Univision. And then you have to remember that, that ESPN is also producing the, the live feed that can go anywhere in the world. So they're also doing that as well. So, and if anybody wants that, I'm sure there's sub licenses for those and how it goes. That I don't might be, It's weird. Yeah. That it's might weird be where they make you, like the cross, money. cross satellites and stuff like that. Right. I mean, it's like, it's our satellite. So you have to pay us cause we're bouncing it off our side. I don't know. It's, it's crazy. It's too, it's too complicated for me. There's, there's someone above our pay grade figuring that all out. The, sure the last, is. last little bow that we'll put on it is the article does mention that they're worried that this bad, the bad feelings may have an impact on the negotiations. The, this is something I know we, we may want to blow it off and say, oh, maybe it won't. But the reason why you get these good TV deals is competition. You have uh, suitors going against each other and ESPN and Fox having, you know, been holding the rights for so long, you want them to try to up the bid as much as possible. I know CBS, uh, I think, was involved in Champions League rights recently. So there are some other players in the game, but you want to try to keep the players that are in the game happy now. That way you can uh, bump your price as high as you can. So ha- having them as a little bit jaded, a little bit uninterested, you know, it really could be a factor. So it, the, I don't think that was thrown in there as a throwaway. I think that's something that is a possibility. Yeah. I, I would say that, you know, maybe that means that they split, split it again and maybe it's going to be one company bidding and maybe that turns out better. Um, you know, NBC, NBC sports used to carry MLS. I mean, you know, we, and by the way, they had very high production value whenever they did it. I was, you know, I, I think I was sad to see them go. Their Premier League coverage is, is is great. So if they were someone who went after it, I don't know that they're in the same market, but but you know that'd be a, a an outlet that I'd be happy with if they, if they went after it. Well, it's it's interesting too that Fox, I believe, doesn't have too many soccer rights left. Whenever you're looking at it, because they lost Champions League, um, I think they have Bundesliga, but I think that even that might be coming to an end. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that seem like they are, they're ending here in rapid succession for Fox. Um, and just in the way that you know, I remember just Fox sports, not too longer and Fox soccer, what they were doing was they had a whole bunch of writers that were writing content. I mean, I was on the Fox website like every day. Uh, and then all of a sudden they went to video and I was never on the Fox website again. Um, so they've been making choices and trying to figure their way through. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how they come out of this and how interested they are in major league soccer. Uh, whenever that happens. One of the things we know that will not happen, however, in the Orlando tournament um, is they will not be playing the national anthem. Um, I think this was done in order to save time. I don't think it was everything. And, uh, to be honest, the national anthem is more of a uh, spectator thing uh, than it is just uh, games. And as anybody who watches games in Europe, in the UK, or anywhere around the world, they don't play the national anthem unless it's a national team game. There's usually no national anthems before things. Um, and I don't think... And people certainly jump to a a conclusion, which is that Garber doesn't want protests. And it doesn't seem that that's the case in this way. And whenever it comes back to stadiums, whenever they have it, if there's fans in the stands, I'm sure that they will have national anthems. I'm sure they'll do all that stuff. Um, But it's it's just this interesting thing that's going on in the Orlando tournament. But Bruce Arena, former L.A. Galaxy uh, general manager, head coach, uh, Bruce Arena extraordinaire, uh, former U.S. men's national team coach twice. Uh, Bruce got jumped in on this now as he's currently the New England uh, jet, uh, head coach, excuse me, um, and GM. Uh, and Bruce Arena jumped in and he, he said this, and I'll, I'll read the quotes here, Hammer. I'll let you sort of think, uh, give your take on it. He goes, I think it puts people in awkward positions, Arena said. This was uh, on an ESPN article. He goes, we don't use national anthem in movie theaters or on Broadway or for other events in the United States. I don't think it's appropriate to have a national anthem before a baseball game or an MLS game. But having said that, I wanted to understood that I am very patriotic, but I think it's inappropriate. Um, and then Arena went on to have this quote as well. He says, think about it. In Major League Soccer, most of the players that are standing on the field during the National Anthem are international players. They're not even Americans. So why are we playing the National Anthem? With all due respect, I live in the greatest country in the world, but I think it's inappropriate uh, talking about the National Anthem. So I, 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 didn't, I, never ha- I never thought about it that the players who are, I mean, you know, and that's as true across yeah. Major League Soccer. We talk about n- national team players or, or American-born players not getting playing time in Major League Soccer and usually being on the bench. And for the most part, 
part, most starting lineups in Major League Soccer consist of the majority of internationals. Uh, and so they're not even U.S. They, they don't I don't think they really care. Um, so yeah. why why do we still do it? <laughs> I think, it, like you said, it's the spectacle. It's the tradition in American sports, something that's always been done. So uh, for him to say it's inappropriate, I don't know that that's the right term or maybe it's just a commentary on everything that's going on right now. Uh, it's appropriate deeming that every sporting event in the country that's something that's happened so it's just keeping with the tradition uh the reason why they're not going to have it in orlando i agree with you i think it is when you watch games on tv they don't broadcast the anthem and if there are no fans in the stands then there's no reason uh to broadcast it and you know the, if some there was something mentioned about you're taking away an opportunity for players who wanted to protest with black lives matter and everything going on right now but i think you've seen it with the other leagues around the world with Warm up shirts, and th- there are going to be ways that they can still make those statements if they want to make those statements. The anthem doesn't necessarily have to be that venue. So if it is taken away, I think it's because of TV rights. Bruce is, uh, he- he's onto something. It's funny. He says, I want to make it very clear that I'm patriotic, you know, and that's something I will say right now. I think right now, waving an American flag and, and, and getting decked out in, uh, your red, white, and blue, your stars and stripes has certain connotations with it. And I'm a, a guy who loves the U.S. national team and waving the flag and doing all that. And uh, so it's just kind of funny that uh, there are connotations that are now uh, assigned to that. So he has to have that caveat. Say, I'm, pa- I'm patriotic. Just because I'm saying it's not appropriate uh, doesn't mean that I'm not patriotic. So I, I feel him 100% with what he's saying there. But if it went away, especially with all the controversies that's going on around around with anthems. I think it, it is a good evaluation to say, is this necessary? And in, in all actuality, it's it's probably not necessary. Uh, and then especially when you make the point about international players, the article that pulled this quote, I think they said of the 722 players in the league, 400, 400 plus were international. So more than half the league is not American. So it, then then it begets, gets to be a little bit ridiculous. And then if you want to get super ridiculous, it's when the Vancouver Whitecaps are in town and you play – <laughs> Star Spangled Banner and O Canada and, o Canada. and, and yep. how, how many Canadians are on the roster there. So, uh, you know, I, I think maybe it's time that we evaluate sports in our country and say, OK, maybe the anthem isn't isn't necessary. You know, there are times that you can play it and be patriotic and be proud of your country. Uh, but before a sports game, maybe maybe it's time to let that go. Uh, Reddit, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was all over this one, obviously, and was talking about how they're like, no, 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 we need to go the other way. Uh, we need to play all the national anthems of every player who's on the field. In fact, they have to walk out to go. their national anthem. And by the way, if you have like three Panamanians, it doesn't mean you play it, play it once for the three. No, no, no. <laughs> you play it for every three single times. person who comes out of that locker. I, I thought that was great, uh, in terms of that, uh, from what I understand, uh, a lot of this, National anthem came uh, either World War One, World War Two in baseball. They started doing that, and then um, it got a little more commercialized. Um, certainly after 9/11 and some other areas uh, with the NFL and basically the military paying for this. Remember, we had there was a scandal going on in Major League Soccer and across sports. Whenever everybody figured out that the military was paying sports leagues to honor heroes before the game. Um, and that was a, that was a whole, whole deal. And, um, I know that, uh, yeah, yeah, it was marketing. Exactly. And so Mm -hmm. I know MLS was part of that. I know the NFL was part of that. I think major league baseball was, so everybody was taking money from the government to basically market the military and, and the heroes, which, um, I have all, I have so much respect for, for people who are in the military. I know it was something I've never been able to do. And the fact that they're able to fight for our freedom and protect our freedom is, is amazing. I'm not, I'm not knocking that at all. I'm just saying the the pay to do that uh, seems seems dirty. Um, and so, you know, I think that now those things happen and they're not paid for anymore because of that scandal that went about. Um, but again, you know, for me, it comes down to this is, do you need the anthem played before a game? And the answer is no, you don't. And it doesn't change anything about that game at all. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, you can, I'll, the really biggest advantage to it, there's two things that you would miss. Um, one is uh, Malia Emma, right? Or uh, yeah, yes, Malia Emma. That, that's exactly um, who I, I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. That's a bummer um, to have her, her go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you would miss out on that. Um, and the, but the the bonus part on my side is I wouldn't have to hear. Um, I wouldn't have to hear Larry complain about the national anthems who's always standing next to me. So that would oh. be a po- a bonus part for me. So uh, uh, I gotta say we'll another see. another con, and I, I hate to be negative here. Cosmo raising the fist when the fireworks go off towards the end. It's a highlight that, for me. That, 
So, yeah, you would miss so, the, you would miss the fireworks yeah. as well. I mean, we're yeah. thinking these are practical reasons for for all of this. <laughs> um, you know, Don Garber recently was talking about the the MLS players' ability to protest during the national anthem, and basically, I think they had a statement that came out like two years ago that they reiterated and basically said, if you want to protest, go ahead and protest. Um, so, you know, those are, those are interesting things and, and that they support the, that right. So I, again, this Orlando deal is not something that is going to change that. Um, I, I don't think it, I don't think it changes much on that front, but whenever teams start coming home and whenever fans start going back in, this could be something that changes. Um, so I, I think it's yeah. going to be interesting to sort of watch, uh, the tug of war that will happen on, on that. Yeah. You, I mentioned earlier, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for players who want to speak out and want to protest and have their voices heard. There'll, there'll be ways for them to make that happen. I think you you mentioned it when after 9-11, you saw you know, the big flag come out and it become a thing. I think that when you have times of crisis and you know countries and special circumstances, that may be a time, okay, we're going to play the, our first game back. We're going to play the anthem. And you, the, it's, it's almost more special when you play it in meaningful situations as opposed to you're just going through the motions and doing it every game. So maybe doing away with it as a regular occurrence, but maybe for, the, you know, the MLS Cup final or especially Super Bowl. July you 4th? You still keep it for July 4th. You keep it for, for the spectacle. I was going to say, um, there's been many a times when I've had a little tear in my eye during the national anthem after a special day. I get it, 100%. Um, you know, the Holiday Bowl used to have one of the largest uh, flags. It was a handheld flag. Basically, it took up the entire um, you know, stadium. The entire football field would be filled with an American flag. I remember going to um, Holiday Bowl games when Arizona State would play in them. And do that, and I remember that being really cool. So I mean, there's some cool things. Again, I don't. It's I don't want people to think that I have anything against it. I don't. I just <laughs> it, it's it's about asking about the purpose of it, and is there a yeah. purpose? And if it went away, are you losing anything? And for me, you're not losing anything. Um, yeah. And and I and I think Bruce is trying to say that, which is, you know, are we? It, does it make sense more than anything else? It's not even, I think it's inappropriate. It's, does it make sense? Um, so I, I think, again, Bruce, you know, hey, Bruce hits him on the head. Everyone. Whenever he stops <laughs> with the whole, I'm going to mess with journalists, Bruce usually has uh, interesting yeah. things to say. I'd also like to say uh, in the chat room, everybody says that uh, Malia Emma can just figure out how to sing the This Is L.A. song, right? So if she just figures out how to sing that, the remix version, then we're 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 set. We're gold. We don't miss I was going to say. The Malia Emma, this is LA Briggs crossover. When that happens, just take me out right there. I'm done. What yep. a way to go out. Yep. <laughs> <sighs> It'd be great. It'd be great. I still love that the Briggs came and played that song live playing in the LA Riot Squad section during an LA New York matchup in like twenty eleven, I think, or twenty twelve. It was great. That was still that was that was a fun that was a an all time. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about the transfer window. Now we've been talking about the transfer window, Eric, and how it doesn't have a set time and we don't really know what's, when it's going to happen. And we know that it's going to be different, but we don't know exactly how, you know, it just, it's been so, so crazy with all this stuff that, that with, um, you know, the changes in schedule and everything. So how is the transfer window going to come out? Sam Steschel again, in sort of his notebook was able to sort of, was able to cover this and find out what looks like, uh, it's going to be the transfer window. It looks like MLS is going to allow a two-day transfer window prior to this tournament. Um, so that two-day transfer window will allow player, uh, teams to bring people in because the transfer window is closed right now. So people are announcing signings, but technically they can't be put on the roster until that transfer window opens up all technicalities. Um, so it looks like they're going to do a two-day transfer window prior to the tournament, which would allow any of those players to play in the tournament. Great. Okay, perfect. But how are we actually going to get you know deals done this summer uh, when it goes. And so what it sounds like is MLS is going to open up a much longer uh, transfer window following the tournament and setting everybody up for this regular season. So I would expect that after August 11th is the last day, I think, of the uh, yes. of the championship. Yeah, I would imagine that next week or even maybe the day after that tournament, the transfer window is going to open up and you could see a 30 or 45 day transfer window that sort of stays open for a while that allows teams to bring people in, move them around and do that stuff. Um if yeah, the other wrinkle of that is, is with the two-day transfer window that also gives them opportunities to sign players from their USL clubs or their, uh, you know, their academies because we know they're going to want to fill out their rosters. There's going to be games close together, so if there are any call-ups that they need to do last minute, they can do that. So it makes sense that w we had a feeling there was going to be a one-time 
uh, exception with everything, all the circumstances in, in the world. They were going to need to extend the windows to give teams uh, an opportunity to make up for it. So this isn't surprising. It's nice to hear that it, it's, you know, almost official uh, that they're going to get the opportunity to do that. And uh, it just lets you know that Dennis DeClosa and, and the front office for the LA Galaxy, uh, we know that there's rumors going around, so we know they're probably out trying to make deals happen. And it looks like they'll be able to facilitate them before the end of this calendar year. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I will also tell you this. Uh, keep your eyes open for some USL players uh, that look like they will be loaned up to the LA Galaxy. So from LA Galaxy 2 to LA Galaxy, uh, Galaxy can take a roster total of 30 players to the tournament. The Galaxy only have 24 players currently on the roster, and that includes Danny Acosta, who's injured and probably will not be available for this tournament, although he's getting closer. it's I still think he has like a month, month and a half before it all comes together, but we'll see how it goes. Maybe he's done a lot sooner. Um but with the cost of their, so they basically have 23 players. So if everybody uh, who they have on the roster, uh, minus Danny Acosta, is that they all get to dress for a game because we know it's 23 players get to dress for games uh, instead of the 18 with the five sub rule um, going on. So a deeper team. So the Galaxy need to get a whole heck of a lot deeper. And the only way to do that cheaply right now is to go down to USL and pull some players up. Um, so, you know, I don't know the players' names. I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but I would imagine that at least one or two are certainly going to come up. Um, and I heard that there's some rumblings that that could happen here in the next, obviously, couple weeks. So just sort of look for that. And I would imagine, I would say keep watching the videos because you might see some of those guys training with the senior team. That That's usually a tip off. I was going to say, if you're a sleuth like myself and you look at those training photos carefully with magnifying glass, you can probably figure out who's going to get those call ups based on who's in the background um, with with no League's Cup this season. Uh, these are players who would get called up for those types of games. So the tournament being kind of a special occasion and needing to fill depth, that's those are the type of players you're going to get to see. Uh, someone, you know, like Nick DePew shined last season getting called up in those those games. So you might have another uh, person who gets that call up and they shine and they're able to make a spot and maybe they'll be part of this team going forward. Uh, it's, I, I would think that, you know, I had predicted that, uh, Kai Kareniuk would, would already be on this team at this point. Um, so I would expect now that he would get this. That's my, that's my assumption. That's not, I wasn't told that, uh, I was told that some USL players will be making their way up. I wasn't told names, but I imagine that Kareniuk will be one of those guys. So we'll see, we'll see how it all goes down and we'll see who ends up on the roster. But I would imagine the galaxy take as close to 30 players as they possibly can, because with the tournament, with a lot of games, uh, coming in rapid succession. We don't know what that is, obviously, because the schedule's not out. But whenever we do, we will know what that looks like. Um, they're going to have a lot of players. And with five subs, it gives a lot of people a chance to get on the field. Uh, maybe somebody like Gordon Wild. Uh, I know the Panda talked to, to Wild today uh, about some stuff. So look for that article, I think, out on the LA Times here uh, in, 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 in the near future. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a plug to Gordon Wild. Yep. His Instagram yep. game, pretty strong, I will say. So if you're not following Gordon Wild, He's he's a, a discount Sebastian Legit, I think. I think he's he's going uh, that does, route, uh, but he maybe just doesn't uh, have the same, uh, not the same level of player. No 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 offense to him, but you know he, he it's the same type of feel. So Gordon Wild, hell of an Instagram, well done. Well, he, not only that, <laughs> uh, we know that his his family is a circus family, right? We've talked about that before, yes. where his family comes from the circus. Um, so there's that. He's German. Uh, there's that. And uh, he won a cooking contest. And I don't know what cooking contest it was. I swear to God, I didn't look at it. But he won one. And that's one of the reasons he's, I think the panda was I'm, talking he, to him. So he, He's coming across as one of those, like, the most interesting man in the world. You just keep peeling and peeling these layers. And you find out more. He seems to be a good locker room guy as well. Uh, gets along with a lot of other guys posting videos, training with other players. And there are players from pre previous teams commenting and doing stuff. So you can tell he... Uh, you know, the Galaxy needed some locker room help. Gordon Wilde, maybe we haven't seen him on the field yet, uh, except for some limited preseason minutes, but he may be that type of glue guy in the locker room that you need. Yeah, he seems like, a, apparently he speaks like 11 languages. I don't think that's actually 11. I think that's hyperbole, but there's a lot of languages <laughs> he speaks in there, which once again reminds me how lazy I am. Um, all right, let's go to uh, our next thing here. And as we're talking about Orlando, we can't not talk about the rise in COVID-19 cases in Orlando. Basically, uh, in the recent weeks, they went to about, and again, we talk about metrics, and I think it, it's probably on brand for this show that we talk about like charts and stats and, and some of that stuff. Um, one of the things that's important to talk about is the percentage of positive cases, because there's lots of people who are going to tell you that as you test more, 
you're going to get more cases, which is correct. As you test more, you will absolutely find in number count, you should find more cases. But as you test more, you're, if the, if the disease, if, if the virus itself is, is, you know, sort of waning and is going away, you're going to find the percentage of positives dropping. Uh, as you test more. So yeah, you're getting, you know, you tested a hundred people or you tested a hundred people and five people tested positive, but before, you know, it was, uh, you tested 50 people and 10 people. And so there's a larger percentage. So watch those percentages as they go around. And the big problem is that basically the positive cases and the number of cases have skyrocketed in, 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 I was going to say Arizona, that's another hotspot, uh, <laughs> that, in that's Florida. That's also true. <laughs> They, I was I, I got that one right too. Uh, in Florida, uh, they added today three thousand or maybe it was yesterday. Um, the overnight, uh, it was they added three thousand two hundred seven more cases in Florida, um, and that's a new record for them. And then the percentage of cases basically went from about two and a half percent positive cases to five percent. So basically, they doubled. Um, so everything's trending in the wrong direction and so much so that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who has taken a ton of heat about a lot of different things, uh, had to come out and acknowledge that the things are not headed in the right direction. And he said it's because you're not listening to the things that we're telling you and about the social distancing and about, you know, wearing your masks and, and all those types of things. So it's it's that seems to be the problem. But the real the real issue here is that you're seeing spikes in cases in Orlando, which is where this tournament is going to be. And whenever I. I had retweeted this and talked about this a little bit on Twitter. People started arguing with me. It's like, well, they're not going to be in the general public, so why are you complaining? Um, and the re and the reason that we're highlighting it is that while the players themselves will not be in the general in the general public, um, what we are seeing is that the employees who are there are not going to be quarantined, and so those employees are technically the general public, which means that they're going to be in contact with some of the players. It's just it's just something to watch as this goes. MLS picked Florida because one, Florida was open and willing to have them, and two is because the counts and cases were were low. Um, if this starts to spiral and skyrocket during this, you have a question of whether or not a tournament should be held, Eric. Uh, and then lots of things start getting questioned. Yeah, I, I'll push back on you there. I think the reason the tournament was held in Orlando is because there's the wor wor wide world of sports campus and, and Disney resorts, and that makes it a lot easier uh, for an ESPN property to make that happen. And we've, we've talked about that ad nauseum. Uh, when you say that there are people who are saying it doesn't matter, um, because they're going to be away from the population. It me, that was me. I was one of those guys said you can have it in Orlando. It doesn't matter if you know, the world is on fire around them because they're going to be taking precaution and, and doing that. But when you think about it, um, if there are, or there's a rise in cases, then that means people in the area, there's going to be more opportunity for exposure. And so that that's where it gets concerning is um, would rising cases in and itself shut the tournament down? No. But if you have more chances for exposure, especially with hotel staff and if uh, production crew, you know, if ESPN, the production crew or the Fox product, you know, whoever's work where it's ESPN is producing it. But if they're, you know, out and about and something happens and, you know, gets brought onto the field, you, you increase your chances. So I've kind of walked back that that thought that it doesn't matter where they do it because they're going to be taking precaution because it's all about exposure and you want to limit that as much as possible. So fingers crossed that it doesn't all go wrong. Just <laughs> you're reading a lot about places that opened up a little too early, uh, maybe having some repercussions in that. So I'm just, you know, keeping the fingers crossed that it doesn't all go sideways and, and, and we're locked down and have lose more, more precious time that we've already tacked on to, you know, what we've already had to go through. Yeah, um, it's it, you know we talk about it too. Listen, a positive test on any player, even in Florida, is not gonna it's not gonna stop things. Um, you know there are plenty of precautions in place and the separations in place that I feel like this is still a good plan. I feel like you know all around them could be glowing red with with COVID nineteen cases, <laughs> and for the most part, um, you're still gonna be able to see a tournament that probably can can go and and be there. But it, you know it, it's one of those things because um, you know I think it was Bill Hamid was talking, and I think on Monday we t we talked a little bit, and maybe even on Thursday we talked about it. Um, is he was talking about how he doesn't want to go there and be locked up. Uh, you're hearing the same thing in, in NBA, which is like, hey, we'll go to Orlando. We'll do the tournament. We'll do the thing. But you can't keep me in in the resort. That's not happening. Like, it's, you know, the whole deal. 
and I understand where that's coming from. But again, if the case is this is where it, it's a problem, it's it's the mixing. If there's if there's chances for infection all around, Orlando's probably going to be one of the hot spots. You know, Disney World is going to open back up. There's going to be people traveling in from all over the place. You'd expect that mix to be there. And and I'll even say this: that it seems so far, and knock on wood, um, that when soccer players, football players get this, that they're they seem to be okay. It's uh, we have asymptomatic. Haven't... Yeah, they seem to be asymptomatic and everything else. And we should talk about it because Atlanta United first team player, we don't know who, tested positive. Um, it's the first, I think, first team player in Major League Soccer to test positive. Or was, wasn't was there one from Philadelphia Union as well? Didn't we have like some Philly guys who had it? I can't remember. Yeah, it's, I don't, I don't follow too much of a mix. Philly closely enough. I know Sacramento, Sacramento had a positive case early on. Uh, yep. Yeah, but I think this is the first, first team player uh, case, or at least confirmed. No doubt FC Dallas had a case. See, yeah, see, the more we think see, about it, there's the more there's been the a more lot of keep them. popping up. Yeah, but yeah, but, that's right. You know, here, here's my uh my my Joe Rogan Science Club here. <laughs> what they talk about athletes? These are people who are in, in peak physical condition, and to fight the virus, that's one of the things they say. A healthy individual is more than likely able to to battle back. So I think this is why you're you're right. If players do test positive, this isn't something uh, that's going to shut down the tournament because it's, most of the time players are asymptomatic and they're able to kind of battle uh, that virus. It's a, now the rest of the population, not always as fortunate percentages are low, fortunately, but uh, I think with, with athletes, it's, it's even lower than the average population. Yeah. It, it seemed to be that way. Uh, Atlanta United announced Thursday, a first team player had tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, the positive result was confirmed following mandatory club testing with no additional staff or players testing positive. The player who's not been ad- identified was asymptomatic and has been observing isolation protocols since the result. That's by the way, that's worth noting. Uh, the protocols go that if you test positive, they isolate you immediately. And then they, then they check you, uh, then they check you again on, uh, 24 hours later to make sure it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a, uh, a, a false, false negative. Positive. Yeah, a uh, false, po- false right. negative. Wait, false positive? It's, false, <laughs> it's one of the false, <laughs> say, whatever it is. Come for the Galaxy News, stay for the shaky science. Uh, my good friend, uh, our good friend there, Pam, just uh, texted in as well and said that uh, an inner Miami player just tested positive as well. So I think this is going to be pretty standard for here on out is that you're going to get some little pinpoints here and there that are going to show this. Uh, Don Garber was asked how many... Um, how many positive tests shut down the tournament? He goes, there's not a number. He goes, because we're going to have to evaluate it. I mean, here's the thing, Eric. One player here, one player there, probably not the end of the world, not a huge thing. Seven players on one team, 12 players on one team, 20 players on one team. I mean, if you start seeing groups and that they're... Yeah, you got to shut it down. Um, And so that's where it's going to be. So we'll have to watch that um, as it continues. So, again, it's not it doesn't seem like it's crazy. I'm I'm not overly concerned, but it's something to continue watching because this isn't just a MLS is coming back. It's a PR battle uh, in terms of the league doing the right thing and saying they're doing the right thing and protecting the players. Uh, It's a player battle who say that they don't want to be locked up and that they're adults and they don't have to be staying at the Swan and Dolphin Hotel the whole time. Um all of these things are sort of happening at the same time. And then, you know, MLS wants to appear as like everything as normal as possible. And so if you see these things starting to go sideways and the PR battle is being lost, um, really this whole season is a PR battle. It's no longer about a star. It's no longer about any of that stuff. It's, yeah. it's just PR. We, we knew that going in. And, and it, it, this I think this falls in the PR bucket. It's a battle for relevance also, uh, because with sports being gone for so long, we assume that the population is going to be a little bit sports starved. So to give them a product and this is your opportunity to maybe your casual fan who wasn't going to check out a regular season MLS game. When they see the format, they see it's world cup style. Maybe they only tune in to a world cup every four years. They say, Hey, the, uh, you know, major league soccer, it's an American league. They're doing a, a world cup style tournament. Let me check it out. It's going to be on at a time that there's no other sports going on. So that's really what they're battling for. So, at what at what cost is it worth trying to gain momentum and keep soccer relevant? Is it worth, you know, putting players at risk? And and some, you know, there are some executives or higher ups who may say that's just the cost of doing business and it's worth it to them. But uh, it's unfortunate. But we're gonna see we're gonna see how it pans out. Well, Fingers uh, crossed. The LA Ti- <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say we'll we'll, we'll see. Uh, the LA Times uh, put out an article today. It's not about Major League Soccer. It's about the NBA. 
Um, but it's what the NBA player in Orlando might go through. And they were talking about the Lakers and the Clippers and doing all this stuff. So I just want to read off some of the stuff that I have on here that is uh, fun. Uh, it's there's some interesting tech that's going into this uh, and how you probably shouldn't expect that same tech in Major League Soccer. Um, <laughs> just it, it seems like, you know, it seems like they're definitely the NBA is is drawing from some deeper wells of, of monetary value here than, than Major League Soccer has at it. Um, they talked about it's a nearly 200 page document that outlines all of the requirements and steps that are go into this health and safety plan for the NBA players. I would imagine Major League Soccer has something that's fairly similar. Um, in terms of how they do it. Um, there are daily temperature checks, duh. There are daily symptom and pulse oximetry screenings. Okay, so they're they're seeing oxygen levels and they're seeing if you have, they're like, do you have a headache? You know, do you have a sore throat? Are you coughing? And like all that stuff. Um, the NBA player, Eric, will wear his magic band. All right, so he has, yeah, I don't know if people, ring. like for, yeah, uh, no, not even that. There's This is different oh. than the ring. So I was going to say, as someone who stayed at a Disney resort, does this mean they get the front of the line? Yes, that's it's exactly that Disney <laughs> band. That's that's what they're talking about. Um, so yeah, he they you wear it's like a watch basically, um, yeah. and it goes around your wrist. Um, and basically, I think it's a little RFID tag in there, and you're able to Scan swipe it. into things. Yeah, and so what this will allow the Magic Band to do will allow the player to get to his room, pass security checkpoints, and into testing areas, right? So that's sort of his access badge. It's like, hey, this is me, and I get to go through it. And um, an and alarm does go off if you go outside of the parameters. If, if you had kids who have signed up for any of the daycare kids' activities, if they step out of the wrong zone, it'll set off a, an alert. So I wonder if they'll have that so they don't leave the campus. Their magic band oh, is in a... Oh, you can, you, can, <laughs> you can bet that they're going to have it, all right? And that's I think that's one of the arguments that they're sort of, you know, going against. Um, they also, and you 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 talked about it, the rings, um, the mood rings, yes. which, which is what they look like. <laughs> um, apparently, they have these rings. Uh, again, Twitter Twitter has so much fun with all this stuff. Um, yes. Twitter. Somebody was like, a, a ring. This ring looks like it's definitely not like you know an Indiegogo um, startup because you'd have to have a working prototype in order to get it right. It's like some off-brand startup site. Um, but they're going to wear rings that they say can detect coronavirus up to three days before symptoms start, uh, and it monitors, I think, pulse and temperature yep. and it's temperature, and respiratory. Yeah, temperature, respiratory functions, and heart rate. And so it's a company called uh, Aura, and you can actually buy the ring now. at the two ninety nine and three ninety nine. So the the rings are available, and so that's something that they're going to utilize. But like you said, t- Twitter being undefeated and being the best, you know, you see people in the comments. This is you know the Clippers. These are the only rings that they're actually going to get. And so you see, you, you end up having that those fun little discussions. You know, the, the Galaxy get five rings. I know you you hit me with that joke. If if they're going to yes. wear rings. Uh, do they get yep. five of them? <laughs> so Some, it, it's just somebody, something to have a little fun with. Yeah, somebody came in and was like, I was like, now I wonder if MLS players are going to be asking for rings. And somebody said, well, we know that the Red Bulls will um, because <laughs> they don't have any. And I was like, oh, come on. That's so harsh. Not not now. They don't need that right now. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, I thought this was fun. If they want to play table tennis, Eric, they can only play singles, no doubles. You're not allowed to play doubles. You singles, and you're only allowed to pick like one dude. You'd be like, hey, do you want to go play table tennis with me? And if he shoots you down, are you not allowed to go play table tennis? It seems like, like <laughs> say, you know, it's. I'm telling you, the reality show aspect turns into The Bachelor. You know, and up oh, he didn't he didn't want to come play table tennis with me. I had to go to my second option. Well, my, I'm your second option. I don't want to go play with you because why wasn't I your first option? So a lot of drama, yeah. locker room drama. I can see it. I can see a chat room saying um, Logan was asking if uh, if Chicharito will get a Toy Story room at the Disney Hotel. <sighs> I love it. I love it so much. I love having the chat room. You, you guys are way the, funnier than I'll ever be. That's yeah. for sure. The, the other thing, uh, and I don't know if you're going to touch on it with the NBA article about, you know, kind of a new normal and how the games are going to work themselves. Players, you know, licking their fingers to get grip. Uh, you know, touching their face. These are all things that they normally do during a game that they're going to have to adjust because it's going to be a big no-no with the new tournament. So I'm curious to see if, um, like you said, MLS probably has their own, you know, rules on what you can and can't do. And so I'm curious to see uh, if the players get briefed on this or or how how that's all going to work. Yeah, it's going to be technical foul for licking the fingers. <laughs> I yeah, I have no idea. It's going to be it's going to be weird. Um, the testing protocols here, testing takes place in the evening to minimize contact between basically the the player and whenever they will receive the results because they'll receive them in the morning probably so they'll run the test overnight. Uh, by the way, the testing for Major League Soccer for the NBA and the amount of tests that they're going to run on a daily basis is going to be 
watch the testing numbers nationally go up once these sports leagues start going over because they're going to be a huge part of the tests that are getting done because it's just a, a, every other day for Major League Soccer, and we know that. Um, if you test positive, then you have to stay, and you get another one 24 hours, and basically they're going to keep testing you until you don't show signs of it anymore, and that's how it's going to work. Um, they're doing the serology tests as well, and that's like once every three months for Major League Soccer, um, and so it's just it's a it's a serious amount of testing that's going to be happening. But um, if in the NBA you refuse to be tested, uh, if you refuse to go through like the symptomatic stuff where they ask you if you're feeling any symptoms or like they don't check the respiratory rates or anything like that, uh, you can't train, you can't play until you're tested. That's how it is. Um, and again, if you test positive, you're isolated until you can be tested again to confirm that the test was was right. Uh, they point out in the NBA uh, in this article that a single test will not shut down the season, right? So if there's one person and we just talked about a major league soccer it's the same way guaranteed it. One thing is not going to shut down. Um, the players, however, receive three meals a day and four meals a day on game days. But you have to remember buffets are absolutely outlawed. So it's all single serving meals that like you get, um, that are prepared for them. And so, so no buffets. Yeah. And the, the other thing that they mentioned is having outings scheduled for them, uh, being able to play golf on a game day earlier and on in the day for a chance to relax. So, you know, we know Bill Amid mentioned, you know, being locked up, but it seems like they're going to try to give them amenities to keep them entertained and keep them their, their spirits high during these times. Yeah, I think the, the you know, you can't even wear your you, you have to wear your uniform back to the hotel, basically, and you have to get it clean there. Like you can't take showers at the facilities. That's not going to happen. Um, and so I'm sure somebody will do laundry, that type of thing. Uh, they're talking about a few on site reporters. And again, this is all for the NBA. This mirrors pretty much what's going to happen for Major League Soccer as well. So understand that outside of, oh, the the one thing, the one bit of technology I forgot to say is that staff. Are gonna the players can opt out of this, but I think that they will opt out of it because I'm sure they won't want to do it. But staff have to wear cards. They have these little cards, and if they get too close to another person wearing a card, if you get within six feet of somebody who's also wearing a card for more than five seconds, like an alarm on the card goes off, it beep 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 beep, and you're like, oh, you man. have to get away, right? I'm like, can I wear that like all the time? I'm like, I'm sorry, <laughs> we're too we're too can, close. Can, this is can I give that yeah. to just select coworkers? <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, you, you sorry. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> yep, that's how it works. Um, so anyway, that was the NBA. I thought that was interesting um, as that went. Now, let's get to the most unexpected news story of everything that I thought we were going to talk about this week um, and a little bit of the timeline of how it came down. Uh, Meg uh, Linehan uh, for The Athletic. Again, The Athletic. This It feels like we should be sponsored by them. If they want to throw us sponsorship money, I'm not opposed to it. I should say that. So don't tell people to like steal stuff anymore. If they want to pay for this, I will gladly. No, I, I, I wasn't recommending. I'm just saying some people do that, so, and it's a shame on people for doing so. I was just that's right. throwing that's it right. out there. Okay. It happens. Okay, good. Good. I'm glad we got that say straight. Um, but uh, Meg did a great job on a story. Uh, she seems to have all of her ducks in a row, as they say, as Pato says, ducks in a row. Um, I'm turning into Kevin Baxter. Somebody shoot me. Uh, so here we go. Uh, the NW, NWSL expansion to Los Angeles. Uh, this is an article by Meg Linehan. Uh, she talks about, and this is how this all went. Let's let's do a little behind the scenes hammer. Uh, let's see. We heard that there was an NWSL team coming to L.A., and we were told that it was an independent group not associated with either of the two L.A. MLS teams in there. And we got in the group chat, and we were like, hey, this is a good idea. This is great because you can draw from both sets of fans, and you're not going to take everybody off and blah, blah, blah. So we talked about how uh, we were all going to go to NWSL games and how it was going to be fun, and we couldn't wait. and We were going to get jerseys, and it was going to be a lot of fun. And then and we I heard the report. Yeah, go ahead. I said before before you even get to that part, uh, I just wanted to chime in because then I was shot down pretty quickly because I said, well, they're not going to build a third soccer specific stadium, so they might end up playing on one of the stadiums. So you're already going to create a division uh, right. between the fan bases because you're going to have to travel to the other stadium. So even uh, as short lived as we had our, our NWSL fandom, we were all excited. You know, it's independent. You, you don't have to worry about arguing with fan bases. And then that tr got shot down pretty quick. And then the next bit of news dropped. Yeah, the next bit of news then dropped. Uh, and and it was that, wait, it's not totally independent. In fact, one of the L.A. teams 
will be involved. Now, we all know, and we've talked about on this program, we've talked to people on this program, we talked to Kevin Hartman whenever he came on, we asked him this specific question, would the LA Galaxy get involved with NWSL? Uh, the fact that the LA Galaxy just uh, canned their Girls Academy program and completely shut it down and seemed sort of haphazardly shut down and quickly shut down, and it wasn't great PR for the LA Galaxy, uh, sort of leads us all to believe at this point, without knowing which team is which, uh, that there was one team that was interested in L.A. that would be some sort of partner. Um, and so that came through. We were all like, well, it's not the Galaxy. It can't be the Galaxy. In fact, if you would have asked me to bet my house on it, Eric, I would have told <laughs> you it's LAFC. We all know that they had sort of aspirations of having a women's team. It's them. And and the other wrinkle is when you look at one of the minority owners and the owners group, it's Mia Hamm. You know, we know right. she's been vocal about wanting uh, a team. And so her connection to the club All those assumptions were that it was going to go to the other team in town. So uh, the Panda got to work. All right. So the Panda reached out to his contacts over there at LAFC, reached out to his contacts at the LA Galaxy. Uh, This is what we know at this moment. And then we're going to tell you a whole bunch of details that could involve um, some teams here. Uh, Panda found out that LAFC said, it's not us. And it was pretty emphatic, right? So there's things that happen. Like, you, you... there's these rules that we all abide by as journalists, which is like, we don't lie to the club and they're not supposed to lie to us. Right. I mean, you can't come out and say something's false. So a lot of times questions we'll ask, we'll say, Hey, we heard your signings, Latani Ibrahimovic. Is that incorrect? Right. And that's, so that's something that you could talk about, Eric, and say, you know, is that, is that incorrect? It's not, I'm asking you if it's happening. Is it, I heard your signings, Latan, is that incorrect? And then usually it's a, well, that's, no it, comment. you're not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not incorrect. Right. And it's yeah. like, okay, so, so you know where, where you're coming from and how you do this stuff. Um, so basically what happens is LAFC says, it's not us. Uh, and then Kevin doing the genius math that he always does is, well, if it's not <laughs> LAFC, then it has to be the LA Galaxy. You reach out to the LA Galaxy and they wouldn't either confirm nor deny that. Um, we don't have any updates on that. I'll tell you right now, it's not LAFC, so it's the LA Galaxy. I mean, we're going to yeah. run on that assumption and that seems correct. And that blows my mind. Um, I didn't expect to be talking about this. I was like, oh, for a second, we thought maybe the LA Galaxy would be getting in on an NWSL team. And then it went away. And that, that was what I thought this conversation was going to be. Instead, what we have is that this is an ownership group. It's not a single owner. Uh, AG is likely to be a party to this group. So they're going to be part of it. And they may not even, Eric, be a major majority owner. They may yeah. not have an ownership stake at all. They may just be an operational partner, as uh, Meg talked about in there. So, um, but yeah, it seems like the, it's the, the LA Galaxy. Yeah, the primary name it says on the filing was uh, Julie Ehrman, and so she's an entrepreneur, and her name was on most of the documents. So um, be her, be, that lets you know that it's if it's part of a group, she's the one who may be leading the group, or she may be the one who you know may be running a smokescreen. She may even be not the main person, but someone who you're not going to find ties to the galaxy. You're not going to find ties because it's a, a tech entrepreneur. It's someone who kind of came out of nowhere, and they mentioned that in an article that it was a bit of a surprise. Uh, but when you look at the trademarks that were filed, one of the trademarks that was filed was for Angel City FC. And so when you think about Angel City, the connections, the Galaxy Angel City Brigade, you know, things, you start putting pieces together and it, it seems to seems to make sense. Yeah, and, and what we have to say is, you know, what is an operating partner in this stuff, Eric? I mean, that's that, that sort of makes sense. I mean, what it probably means at the very minimum, and, and basically Meg says that, that the MLS team could have an ownership stake, um, but is definitely probably going to be an operating partner. An operating partner in this case would mean, hey, we have all of this stuff that we do to operate a team, and we can help you operate your team with that you we have pr we have front office staff we have training facilities we have stadiums we have concessions we have all these things and it makes sense for us to help you out um and there's some cost savings within that to already be part i mean really when you think about it the la galaxy run uh the la galaxy senior team the la galaxy 2 um the pr departments technically handled like stuff for you know the academy teams as well so you have this machine that already does this throw a women's team in there and really there's locker rooms at you know dignity health sports park that are ready they already do all this stuff so it makes sense to to be partner with one of these teams and it's the la galaxy in this particular case um that they it looks like they're going to partner with now it could be that the aeg owns some some share of this maybe it's a majority maybe it's a minority however it ends up going 
um, it looks like the LA Galaxy will be linked in some way uh, to an NWSL expansion team, um, which is, I don't know, it's exciting. It's exciting for me. I, I, think so. I, 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 w- I watch games. I watch the LA Soul games. I've been to LA Soul games. Uh, I remember there, I remember watching Marta play. Um, I always thought it was stupid that there weren't more double headers, quite honestly. Like, come for the women's game and stay for the men's game, or, or you're at the men's game, stay, stay for the women's game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Do you could you know if it's an afternoon game like a nationally televised game at you know noon for some stupid reason that we always end up at the stadium <laughs> at noon. Um, I really don't like noon games. Uh, for for you know the LA Galaxy, then you can stay for you know the NWSL team that's going to play afterwards. Um, the paperwork to formalize the expansion deal with NWSL still needs to be agreed and signed upon um, by Ehrman and the ownership group. Um, and then there was a whole bunch of other stuff. So, uh, in the, in the article, there was a quote that said, you know, the LA, the LA group was waiting both to see how the preparation for the challenge cup was handled by commissioner Lisa Baird and the league, as well as to avoid having an expansion announcement overshadow news of the tournament yes. itself. Um, the challenge cup, by the way, for NWSL, the first professional team that's technically back, uh, for, uh, for in the United States, it's NWSL. They start June 27th in Utah. Um, and they have new major sponsorships from Procter and Gamble, Secret, and Verizon. Uh, and so, so talks between the league and the expansion group remain productive. So, um, very interesting stuff that's going on right now. And apparently, yeah. there's already a tenth team. Um, and by the way, my NWSL knowledge is such crap. <laughs> okay, and it really has to do with the fact that there's no team here in LA. If there was a team here in LA, I guarantee yeah. it, I'd pay more attention. It piques to it. interest. It does. And, and, you know, I was I was going through and, and again, looking at all this stuff, um, you know, the US, it, it looks like the, the NWSL is adding a 10th team. Uh, Louisville City will be joining. And so this L.A. team could possibly be the 11th team. Um, I think there's some other Sacramento also in the hunt for an NWSL expansion team, uh, newly admitted to Major League Soccer as well. So, um, you know, you could have 12 teams and two California teams here pretty rapidly. Uh, but it's uh, all there. Uh, by the way, um, Makes it exciting. Do, do you follow do you follow any of the NWSL teams? I don't know. I, I, I I'm going to be honest. I don't follow it in depth. You know, I, you know, because I'm big on Twitter, you see uh, crowds at games and you see, you know, you know, finals when it gets to playoffs and, and things like that, you start to see it pop up a little bit more. Uh, you know, obviously women's world cup. Um, I'm all in on that every, right. every four years. And then when you see players, uh, stars from that, from the, that world cup, you see them playing. There's that hangover effect afterward where you start to follow a, a little bit more. So I'm going to be honest. I, I don't, I'm not all in, but having a team in LA with connections to the LA galaxy, you mentioned, you know, the suite with, you know, PR and, and everything that goes on. I think at the very, at the bare minimum, something like the chargers who rented out the facility that you just host them and then they have their right. own operations and make it happen. I think that's the bare minimum, but you know, I think what you're saying about the, the front office operations, that'd be an added bonus uh, in that case. So it, it's exciting. I'm curious to see how it all pans out. They didn't want to overshadow the, the challenge cup. So it totally makes sense on why they're holding off it to it. Uh, but it also is good timing. Cause if you have all eyes on the challenge cup and you say, okay, now that we got your attention, we have these new teams joining and you're able to capture the, you know, people who may like me who weren't interested, uh, who weren't necessarily all in in, in WSL, but now I know LA is getting a team. So maybe I'm going to be a little bit more interested uh, in watching that challenge cup. Well, let's get to some Reddit questions and Hey, all my Reddit fans, uh, or Reddit listeners, I should say, um, the Reddit, I, I don't know. I just like their questions. Reddit always comes up with good questions and like Twitter is just, I just don't think Twitter is made for asking questions for whatever reason. It doesn't work. Twitter's but, not made but Reddit, for, yeah, Twitter's, Twitter's not made for nuance. Reddit, no, it's if you not. want to do a deep dive in detail and, and, you know, right. read a, a 15 paragraph description, that's, that's where you go. Well, let's let's continue on the NWSL theme because we did get an, a, a question from Galaxy Fan eighty uh, nine. They say Alex Morgan aside, uh, who would you like to see as a top target the Galaxy should look to sign if the women's team rumors are true? Again, I don't know if they're going to be like in a in a, a a majority role where they're actually going out and making the signings and all that stuff. Um, but I do find this question at least interesting because um, I have some favorites uh, for sure that you would think you know it, again. I think everybody's going to think U.S. Women's National Team, and that's correct. That should you should start there. But whenever you throw out the question, Alex Morgan aside, because that that should have been your first. That's yeah, that, that's your that's, that's the number that's the one answer. answer. With a, with a yeah, that, that, yes. That, yes, absolutely. So it's Alex Morgan. You were correct, and that that's who it was. Um, but for me, let's go local. 
uh, Kristen Press needs to be uh, on on a team in Los Angeles. She's from L.A. Um, I think I should also be honest and say that um, I have an, I have an obsession with Kristen Press. She is amazing, <laughs> a great footballer, super smart. Uh, she's from L.A. Uh, it's she's she's just the, the top. So maybe work a trade with Utah, bring her in. Um, you have uh, Ada Hergerberger, and I'm never I never say it right, but the Norwegian <laughs> who won the the yep. Ballon d'Or um, from Olympic Lyonnais. Um, and so you would go international with that. She again, I mean, you're talking about the best player um one of the best players in the world of women's soccer um you could bring her in and and do that um i'm a huge fan of rose lavelle um as well i actually was going to wear my rose lavelle kit but i'm too fat for that so i couldn't do it so rose i (laughs) I apologize i need to get bent shape i've put on the full covid 19 maybe covid 2025 so i i feel you there um you know I, i alex morgan and christian press because of them being local there was someone there were a couple of people who are at the top of the list. If you, you go with like who would be like a superstar, you, you mentioned, uh, I'm not even trying to say the Norwegian name, but someone like Sam Kerr from Australia, uh, Rose Lavelle, but there's not necessarily a local connection. So that makes it a little bit right. trickier. I think marketability, if you're making a splash, U.S. women's national team, you pick a star, someone from that pool, uh, if, if you're going to try to sell seats and make it a, a marketing move. A shout out for uh, Mallory Pugh. Um, yep. Crystal UCLA Dunn. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you could again. We could. The cool thing about women's soccer is, and it's it's similar in men's soccer, but I feel like that you can find so many local players, like people in well, in the NWSL right now who are like went to UCLA, one of the top programs, you know, in the country. So. USC has been on fire with their women's program the last five years. So with USC alone, you almost you can bring you know graduating USC seniors just transition into the Los Angeles team and you, you would have a solid program. Yeah, it would be a, it would be a lot of fun. All right. Uh, let's go to the next topic here. Uh, Barry is in the light now. See, that's why Reddit's fun too. They get to have much longer screen names. <laughs> uh, any chance we pick up Herving Lozano as a, on, on a loan from Napoli? Uh, he said he signed a five-year contract and has fallen out of favor with uh, with his coach. The guy is a dynamic attacker in a similar situation as Pavone, given Dennis DeClose's history. I'd love to see this move, even if it's temporary. All right, Eric. Uh, he was on, I believe, a fifty-five point five million dollar transfer fee from PSV. So let's just put that. That's one of the reasons why Napoli, by the way, would not just sell him is because very few people are going to pay, you know, the forty-eight million dollars or forty-four million dollar euros, however, however that came across, um, for him right now. And so them trying to get any money back on that is going to be difficult. Here's the interesting thing. First of all, I say no, it's not going to happen. Here's the interesting thing, though. His salary, I think, is below like $5 million a year. It wouldn't be a huge stretch for the LA Galaxy to go and pay that. Um, But here's the other twist on this. First of all, there's other big name clubs who are already interested in him. As soon as this came out, I think even uh, Chelsea was like, hey, we'll take him. Um, So you're not going to beat that. And for Napoli to give him to Major League Soccer doesn't give them any value, right? Because if they give him to Chelsea, and even if it's a transfer or if it's a loan, they loan him to to Chelsea. They can that, that that there's value to that. If he plays well, Napoli can then bring him back and do it. If he plays well in Major League Soccer, as much as I love this league, what, what does it do for him? It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't and, increase his value. And a player, a player at his age, um, is yeah, like you said, it's not necessarily going to r- make that value skyrocket. Someone, I like the Pavone comparison because Pavone is someone who, at a time, was thought to have that type of transfer fee that high of a number linked to them the only thing is that it never was and so the move to major league soccer made a little bit more sense because he wasn't at that value yet the thought was that he was eventually going to get to that uh that value but there's also a reason why lozano fell out of favor with napoli so i don't know that you want a player who is coming off of uh you know having some struggles you want someone who's firing on all cylinders uh maybe coming in and, and hungry and wanting to uh, you know, wanting to to prove themselves. And recently that ha- that isn't the news that you've seen connected to this player. I know I'll probably get bashed for that because he's beloved, but yeah, but still. He's he's a Chucky, Chucky <laughs> Lozano. Um, yeah, I mean, if the Galaxy could make it happen, you obviously pull the trigger on it and you do it. There's just, there's very little light at the end of that tunnel for Napoli. So I just don't see the advantage coming to MLS. Uh, Luciferus says uh, Pavone staying till the end of the season. 
and we all say that seems to be the case, but don't just necessarily, I mean, you know, don't go out and bet money on it. I mean, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, yeah, he seems like he's probably going to stay till the end of the season unless somebody wants to like buy him for 40 or $50 million. And then Boca is going to take that and the galaxy are going to be gonna like, say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The galaxy don't get any of that anyway. So yeah. End of yeah, the year. It does it. Enjoy him. Yeah. Enjoy him while you, yeah. while you can watch him. That's right. Um, so this one is from Jugular Vein. It's just amazing. Uh, Josh, a lot of people, this one's a longer one, but that's okay. Uh, Josh, a lot of people don't know that they are planning a t- continuation of the season after the mini tournament. He goes, most of your listeners and viewers do know that. Yes, because we say it all the time here, all right? And and again, I think maybe I need to like write an article that just has a headline that says, MLS is planning a regular season after the tournament, and then be like, we, yeah, this is happening. Um, he says, do you think the new schedule predicated upon who the galaxy played in the mini tournament? So is that one less game against Portland, LFC, LAFC and Houston, or maybe no more games? I can't remember what MLS said about after the season. I remember hearing a proposal that only Western conference teams will play each other. Does that still hold true? If so, this season is such a joke with all the last expense with, with all the last expansion teams, Miami, Cincinnati, Nashville being in the East rhetoric question, rhetoric, really not a question. Um, no. So again, from what we heard is it's all going to be conference. This, right, Eric? Um, and we don't know what that means for the tournament. We have no idea. We don't know if it means that you're not going to play Houston, Portland, and LAFC anymore. It could mean that you play only Portland, Houston, and LAFC for the rest of the year. I have no idea. And I don't <laughs> keep think it on MLS. A rotating schedule. Yeah, just keep playing. Just go through it over and over and over again. Um, th- and so, think, so we don't know. Yeah, I think from reading the tea leaves on uh, the MLS tournament, it seems to be the MLS tournament is the MLS tournament. And it's not connected to anything else other than counting for three games. I think once they decide whatever the schedule is going to be, I don't think it really matters who was in their group. Uh, if they're probably going to schedule LAFC as many times because that's your closest rival, probably going to schedule San Jose because they're close. You might end up seeing Seattle, Portland, and Houston as well. Maybe not Maybe not Houston. Maybe you get Salt Lake instead or Colorado depending on how regional they want to keep it. Uh, but I, I think whatever happens in the tournament is not going to have an impact on the next part of the scheduling. It's going to be, they're going to keep it. They're going to whatever. make it the schedule convenient regardless of who their opponents were. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's, I think that's probably correct. Um, should MLS and other leagues make the five sub rule permanent? Uh, sure. Do we care? Yes. I've been saying I mean, this for FIFA. Yeah. I think, I, I've, I've been on this bandwagon for a long time that FIFA should increase the number of subs from three because with the depth of squads now, you, you know, it just makes the game a little bit more exciting. Yes, you lose a little bit with stoppages, but where they say if you limit it to stoppages, but you can inject more players, more depth, um, especially, you know, with <laughs> – it's funny. The Galaxy are struggling to field 23 players. But I'm thinking right. worldwide when you have, you know, teams with 20 players who are all first-team caliber players – why not give as many opportunities for those players to shine as possible? And I think it makes the game a little bit more interesting, especially in the final minutes. If you could bring in, you know, instead of your final last gasp sub, maybe you would bring in two or three guys and then it makes it interesting. So I'm curious to see how that's going to pan out. I'm all for, for adding, I think five subs is the number. I think that's where you cap it. Yeah, it's uh, again, it's going to be uh, a, a fun one to watch because I think it does shift the way. Uh, the good news for Guillermo Barrescoloto is he doesn't make subs anyway, so he'll unlikely use five. <laughs> so he'll probably maybe now he'll use three. Maybe I was going to say if, if you're allowed three. five. Yeah, he's allowed five. So now is when he's going to use three. Um, Faux Genius says, what would be your realistic shock signing during the window does that work can you have a realistic shock isn't a shock signing somebody who's like maybe you think is unrealistic like didn't you think zlatan was a little unrealistic and you were like oh but they came in do you, i mean do we have answers i have the right I, answer yeah. i have the what? right answer yes it's, it's cristiano ronaldo oh, come it'd on be a shock. it'd be a shock because of his caliber but it's realistic given his age given he's already told juventus that he's probably not going to be coming back and so it's by the, i by, think it's realistic so, so Jugular Vein actually said, you know, fun discussion with Nani saying that Cristiano wants to come to MLS. Is it realistic knowing he currently makes 31 million euro a year, which translates to 34 million dollars? And my takeaway from that is, sounds like a good time to go to Europe because that's a good exchange rate. I kind of like that. It's not <laughs> not not overly priced. So anyway, uh, 30 million, uh, 34 million dollars a year, and you think that's who's going to pay? How much? What is a realistic amount for Cristiano Ronaldo coming to Major League Soccer? A transfer fee? Jeez, uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. Well, no, not, even tra- I, not even transfer I mean, fee. It, this is his salary. 
yeah. I think if he's making 31 million now, if you pay him 25 million, you're getting a, a later stage. I think that's worth it. You make it up in Jersey sales. So you're talking takes. about, you're talking about Atlanta is a team who could pay him $25 million. Miami is probably a team who could pay him $25 million. They have deep pockets. So, um, that's certainly something that could happen. Um, the galaxy could pay him $25 million. I don't know if LAFC would pass around the hat for $25 million for Cristiano Ronaldo, but I think they probably could find the money somewhere. I think that if they wanted to, they could do it. But I mean, the, 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 the limited landing spots in major league soccer for Cristiano Ronaldo, as far as I'm concerned is Miami or, or the LA galaxy. That That's seems it. like it's realistic. Two. Okay. Okay. Those are your two options. All right. Just want to check. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody asked when will the schedule be announced? No idea. Probably next week. I mean, you know, if we're really getting to it, um, so uh, Jet Blast says, with the announcement that a first-team player for Atlanta tested positive for COVID-19, do you think the tournament will still happen? Will there be more restrictions? We talked about this. It's, it's going forward. One here, one in Miami, some in Philadelphia. Like, those types of things in sporadic sort of random ways and without people getting... Um, getting most getting really getting getting sick we've sort of seen it so um and the final one which we can answer quickly uh or at least i can answer quickly is if the galaxy could get alice and back by when would they have to make an announcement is there a roster due date for the tournament haven't seen one um but you do have to announce you can take 30 players and you have to announce your game day roster 75 minutes before the match starts so technically if he was going to play in a game you'd have to know 75 minutes beforehand but other than that it seems like that it might be again the two-day transfer window it would have to happen in that two-day transfer window to get him back um unless he was out of contract you can add out of contract players at any times all right uh i think that about does it went a little bit longer today but there was a lot of stuff to talk about so um eric you want to uh, tell people where they can find you real quick absolutely you could find me on twitter at gis hammer you could also find me on instagram at galaxy profile that's galaxy p-r-o-f-o-u-l all right if you're looking for me on twitter it's at j guessman j-g-u-e-s-m-a-n and of course at galaxy podcast corner of the galaxy.com is where you can find all of our articles all of our podcasts all that fun stuff all right that about does it a ton to get to an nwsl team possibly on the way la galaxy gearing up all that stuff all right uh you've been listening to corner of the galaxy on corner of the galaxy.com and for mr eric the portuguese hammer i'm josh guessman have a great one everybody you've been listening to the corner of the galaxy podcast cornerofthegalaxy.com You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast and be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye everybody. <laughs>